put a heavy hangar with all that aircraft up high uh, out of the water. Adding the hangar to a conventional sub clearly wasn't the answer. The next seemingly obvious approach would have been to scale up the size of the central cylinder to lower the center of gravity. Well, a, a large single cylinder would be extremely heavy in weight, would have to have very thick walls in order to withstand sea pressure down to 300 or 330 feet in order to hold this above the surface part of the submarine mm. to totally stable yeah. was simply impossible having this traditional submarine design. Tape up the other end and then we can take these. The Japanese came up with an innovative alternative. So now we'll try this twin hull design. Now, it's pretty stable. All right, so it writes itself now instead of just tipping right over. A twin cylinder hull gave the giant sub the necessary width to carry the extra weight. So you have these two mm -hmm. cylinders, which are broader, stronger. The two cylinders amidship, of course, uh, lent to greater stability. Absolutely, well, you can see it's much sort of flatter and more stable, mm -hmm. clearly. With the largest design problem solved, construction plans were drawn up for the new monster sub. The I-400 went into production in January of 1943. Yamamoto needed it fast. The Japanese were losing ground in the Pacific. The previous June, Yamamoto had ordered a surprise attack on the American fleet at Midway Island, hoping to sink the aircraft carriers he had missed at Pearl Harbor. But the Americans had cracked the Japanese naval code, saw the attack coming, and were able to set an ambush of their own. In three days of bitter fighting, American bombers sank four of Yamamoto's aircraft carriers. It was a devastating defeat for Japan. Their carrier fleet was decimated, and thousands of soldiers were dead. The I-400s were now even more vital. But with serious shortages of steel and manpower in Japan, Yamamoto could only commission 18 of the giant submarines. With work on the first I-400 underway, the Japanese Navy began development on the secret bomber that would be carried in the watertight hangar on the deck of the sub. The plane was called the Seiran, meaning mist on a fair day. Like the name indicates, the plane would appear suddenly like a mist, carried by a submarine that would surface once it comes near a target, moving like a ninja. That is how it came to be named Seiran. This is a very poetic name. Lieutenant Atsushi Asamura is the only living member of the elite Seiran squad. At an annual Shinto ceremony, he honors his lost comrades. He still recalls the excitement of being part of the top secret project. We were very surprised when we saw the Seiran for the first time. I thought, is this really a plane that can be loaded onto a submarine? I believe not too many people knew about Seiran, even in the Japanese Navy. The many tests and repeated experiments were done in top secret. With a maximum speed of more than 200 miles per hour and the capacity to carry a 1,700-pound bomb, the newly designed Seiran would be an intimidating warplane. But the Japanese aircraft designers first had some technical puzzles to work through. Although the I-400 was wider than any other submarine of its day, the airplane hangar was only 11 feet in diameter. 
here is the <laughs> hangar on the I-400 mm -hmm. into which this aircraft has to fit. And here we have a um, head-on view in the of same the scale. Same in scale. the same scale. Yeah. Oh dear. <laughs> uh, you know, the fuselage oh, will fit in there, but uh, gosh, you've got the wings, yeah. you've got the tailplanes, and it doesn't fit. Exactly. To accommodate the tight quarters, the Japanese designed wings much like those on the Grumman Hellcat, the most potent aircraft carrier-based fighter in the U.S. arsenal. To minimize the Hellcat's profile for storage below decks, the wings rotated 90 degrees and folded back flat against the fuselage. The Seiran went even further. It had a tail fin that folded down to reduce height. When we do all of that, it fits, it fits, it fits very, 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 neatly. very neatly. Very neatly. But there was still one major problem the Japanese designers had to solve. Before the Seirons could be launched, their engines had to be warmed up, a process that took up to 20 minutes. Starting the engines in the hangar with the vessel submerged would have exposed the crew to deadly carbon monoxide fumes. But warming the engines on the surface meant exposing the sub to radar and air attacks. Once again, the engineers needed an innovative solution. At a small airport in Connecticut, former Air Force gunner Craig McBurney knows all about the problems of warming an engine before takeoff. This is his pet project, a rare 28-cylinder Corsair engine. It's larger than the Ceyron's engine, okay. but shares similar characteristics. Okay, we've got a clear prop. Clear, clear prop. prop. As with many World War II era aircraft, starting the engine cold is a haphazard and messy affair. Right about now is when we start Batteries using off. bad language. The problem is the viscosity of the cold engine oil. You can see how thick the oil is because it hasn't been heated up. And you know how critical the uh, tolerances are inside the aircraft engine, how tight they are and how small the passages are. Wow. So it would really make a significant difference trying to pump that heavy, thick oil through an aircraft engine. Warming the oil makes a noticeable difference. We heat it up to about 60 or 70 degrees Celsius, which is 140, 160 degrees Fahrenheit. It's the same oil that's just been heated up with the preheater. And right through it. Almost. Wow, well, look at that. Like pouring water. What a difference. Yeah. And you can imagine how critical that would be to have the engine heat up that much faster, especially in a combat situation. Mm. Yeah. McBurney uses an external tank to preheat the oil. Inside this container, we have the main engine oil tank here for feeding the engine oil. And then we've also installed our own pre-oil tank with a heater on it. And with the preheater on it, we're able to raise the temperature quite a bit. We can get the temperature up about 120 degrees. So we need to open this valve. And we'll go ahead and open the engine oil tank valve as well. The warm oil can be pumped directly into the cold engine. Clear prop. Clear prop. OK, go ahead, and go ahead and engage the starter. The results are easy to see. Well, I tell you, that's incredible. The temperature's almost already at the takeoff temperature. Amazing difference. Can you wow. imagine in a combat situation? McBurney's warming method was the same one Japanese engineers turned to for the Seirans. It's actually borrowed from a German design. With the engine oil pre-warmed, the plane could be rolled out of the hangar onto the launch ramp. The engine started, the wings, tail, and horizontal stabilizers unfolded and locked into position. The floats attached, and the Seiron launched into the air. We would train very hard, 
trying to shorten the time it takes for the launch, even by a second. The first plane launches, then the second, and then the third. The goal is to launch all three planes as fast as we can. To get the Ceyrons back on board, the engineers designed a hydraulic crane to pluck the airplanes from the sea and hoist them onto the deck. With all the design problems solved, it looked as if the Japanese would be the first to get their superweapon into the war. But then in April of 1943, the I-400 program and the Japanese Navy suffered a devastating loss. American code breakers discovered that Admiral Yamamoto was planning an inspection tour of the Solomon Islands. U.S. fighters intercepted and shot down his plane, killing the man behind the Pearl Harbor attack. It was such a crushing blow to the Japanese Navy that it was a full month before they even announced Yamamoto's death to the Navy, much less the Japanese public. Without the backing of the powerful admiral, the I-400 program quickly slipped on Japan's priority list. Before any subs were completed, the order was slashed from 18 to 9. It would take another year and a half before the first of Yamamoto's I-400s made it out to sea. In December of 1944, the first I-400 was finally commissioned. A few months later, a second sub, the I-401, was ready to sail. The super sub carried three dive-bombing Ceyrons in a 65-foot-long hangar. An 85-foot ramp and steam-powered catapult launched the planes into action, even in rolling seas. The I-400 wasn't just the longest sub in the ocean at 400 feet. It was also the most heavily armed. On the aft deck sat a giant 140-millimeter gun, one of the largest ever mounted on a submarine. Four anti-aircraft guns defended against aerial attacks. And the sub also boasted eight torpedo tubes in the bow. The man appointed to lead the I-400 program was Tasunosuke Arizumi. Arizumi had been in charge of the midget submarine attack on Pearl Harbor. The I-400's crews were picked from the Navy's elite and were very well treated. The corridor was filled with cans of food and other food staples. 